Good evening, everybody. Welcome again uh, for our final night of the series. It's exciting in many ways and a little bit, uh, I guess, disappointing that we'll be gathering like this again, at least anytime soon. But uh, we'll see how things go here on earth and then uh, future in heaven. Um, but let's pray to get things started for tonight. Father God, we're just so grateful to you for bringing us here tonight, for the, the time that you've given us to do this, to come together and share your word with each other, Lord, and just to uh, present what it is you've taught each of us. So grateful, Lord, for the contributions that people have made throughout the last seven weeks. And uh, Lord, we just look forward to, to future days where uh, more discussions can be had. We pray for those who are still on their way or those who are yet to join online, Lord, that you will just bless them with with a calm and peaceful spirit right now. Um, and just uh, guide them in the way that you would have them go so that uh, they can join us tonight. And those, Lord, who for one reason or another can't be here and can't join us online, Lord, we pray blessing on them as well for whatever is preventing them from, from doing that. Just bless this night, Lord, in a special way. We ask that you will just uh, reveal your word to all of us as we go through this information, that it will be clear and concise and understandable the way you would have it to be uh, explained and heard. We just pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Well, um, if you look around the room, uh, you'll see a series of posters that you've probably you've seen, you should have seen throughout the last seven weeks. Um, these are the ones that have always uh, have been presented over time. Um, Gary and Deborah were helping me put them up tonight, and then after we got them up, I stood back and looked around the room, and I, honestly, I got a little bit dizzy. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, when you see it all together, uh, it can be a little bit daunting. Um, and then some of them, when I looked at them, I thought, boy, they, they had to listen to all of that. Um, but I'm grateful for your patience and, and understanding the questions you guys ask. Um, and tonight we want to do a little bit of review of each, all of this, um, along with the, the subject for tonight, which is spiritual and physical preparation. Um, I would like for you to keep Lorraine uh, in mind tonight. She's not here. Uh, this afternoon she got hit really bad by a bug uh, that just knocked her out. Um, I did not find that out until she picked me up from work. So I'm going to be going through her notes for her tonight. Um, by the Spirit's leading, I hope that uh, the information will come across the way he wants it to come across, um, along with whatever I had prepared. Um, but uh, one of the things that we want to do, so I guess you might say the, the wingman is flying solo tonight. Um, but thank you all for being here. Uh, we will go through information off of each of these posters, just as kind of a wrap up for the seven weeks. But uh, first of all, I wanted to do a little bit of a wrap up from last week, from the, the, the rapture week. Um, this is a, a set of information that talks about uh, the robes that are mentioned in Revelation and, and I mean, sorry, in uh, Isaiah and Matthew. And I want to read these verses. Uh, we're referring, referring to Isaiah 61, 10, verse 10, and then we'll go into Matthew. Um, verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns himself with her jewels. Um, and then in Matthew 22, 1 through 13, uh, these two verses are, are create a little bit of a contrast between the garments and the robes that are mentioned in Scripture, I'm referring to the, the, uh, the wedding feast here now. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again in par by parable and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his own business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. 
Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out in the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on the wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he said, and he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into an outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, so a little bit of a contrast tonight that we want to talk about in terms of those, those garments that, uh, uh, that they're talking about here. Um, in Isaiah, it talks about a robe of righteousness, and then in Matthew, the, the wedding garments. So if we talk about what it says uh, in terms of a white robe in the robe of righteousness, there's some cross-referencing here from Strong's Concordance. Um, it's very exhaustive, a, a complete cross-referencing of Scripture. And in the Greek, there's a reference here what number it is in the Strong's Concordance, talking about a long robe or apparel. Uh, and then another reference, a couple more references, that is bright white. When I'm talking about the white robe here now, it's mentioned in Scripture. And the robe is a wool overgarment. So it is something that has been worn over the garment that's is underneath the normal clothing. Um, and the, that robe, or the white robe, is what is, is used or in reference to the Old Testament priests and saints uh, in terms of the kind of robe that will be given to them. And it refers to the souls under the altar in Revelation 6, verse 9. I'm sure you're familiar with that, or at least have heard something about that part of Scripture with the souls under the altar, which is something to keep in mind. Um, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that in just a little bit. The altar is something that is, is important to remember in terms of that. It is an altar, and in terms of the temple, it is an altar that is placed inside the temple grounds. Um, it is a place of worship and sacrifice. Isaac was bound to the altar in, in terms of that sacrifice. Aaron and his seven sons um, and his sons offered um, sacrifices for seven days. They had to sacrifice a bull for atonement, and it was used uh, as, as uh, on an altar for sacrifice. Um, the altar. Uh, sacrifices were used for cleansing and purifying and make holy by atoning and by anointing. And then in reference here to the, uh, the souls under the altar, these are the folks whose their lifeblood was poured out as an offering to God. They were saved, but it was a severe mercy uh, through that, for that salvation. Now, that reference is made in, in, in that, that uh, scripture and verbiage is made in reference to uh, those who are uh, martyred during the tribulation. Those are the ones who end up under the altar waiting for the second coming to be brought in. And, and scripture tells us how they're in under that altar asking God, when are you coming? When, how much longer do we have to wait? Okay, and these are the folks that uh, were converted or did not get to take part in the rapture, but were converted after the rapture during the tribulation and uh, went through a lot or will go through a lot of strife and, and suffering, and will also probably not make it to the tribulation. You've got to be martyred and end up under the altar waiting for that second coming to be, to be taken up. And that, that's, that's where the, the white robe reference is made for them. Now, the, uh, the Matthew 22, 1 through 13 talks about fine linen, or the wedding garment, and the, and the, uh, the raiment uh, that's used there. That is a, a reference to those who... Um, are raptured up and, and believe that they have been saved and, uh, and believe in Jesus Christ for that salvation, and they will be the ones who receive the fine linen garment um, at that point in time. It's bright white raiment, raiment fancy clothing, and to array are the words that the scripture uses. So it is a much more elaborate and distinctive description of what that robe is like uh, compared to the white robe uh, for, for the souls under the altar. Um, Church of Sardis is a reference there where it talks about that also. The bride who makes herself ready uh, is clothed in fine linen. We're talking about that here in the scripture we read in Revelation. I'm sorry, um, in Matthew. And then uh, the armies of heaven are in fine linen, linen and clean and white followed him on a horse. References uh, chapter 19 verse 14 where they were coming with Christ from the clouds. They have that same kind of fine linen and, and raiment robe that they're wearing when they come with him. Um, also, linens in reference to Jesus uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration. There's some text there. And by the way, if you didn't already, uh, you, you can get a picture of these. I'm not going to take a lot of time to read through those verses. 
But uh, that's just another reference for linen. And, and Jesus is taken off the cross and buried in linen. And uh, then there's linen at the empty tomb, of course, where uh, he had left it. Um, there's, there's obviously a distinction between the white robes and the fine linen robes, and the linen that is worn uh, as an outer garment or as the robe of righteousness. So um, that's just kind of a, a little bit of a wrap up to the whole rapture thing, in addition to what we did not speak to last week. Um, but hopefully that clarifies a little bit and what seems to be understood about the difference between white robe and uh, the fine linen and raiment. Okay? Um, now, on to the rest of the night. Um, before we get into the topic of spiritual and physical preparation, let's take a quick scan around the room. Um, and maybe as you go from one poster to the other, you're going to recall a few things that were mentioned, um, and maybe not. Uh, from times past. Seven weeks is a long time ago, starting from that end of the room around to this end of the room from last week. Uh, so let's take a few minutes to just kind of review some of the stuff that we talked about. On this first diagram down here, you have the timeline that we spoke of in reference to uh, the temple, the second coming, the rapture, and the church age, and all of that, beginning with the 69 weeks spoken of in Daniel. Um, and how the, the first and second temple was built uh, during the first uh, 49 years, or the first seven weeks for the first temple, and then the sec 62 weeks, or 434 years, where the second temple was built, um, and then both of which were ultimately destroyed uh, after those 69 weeks were complete, and then Jesus was born. Now, at Jesus' birth, you know, he, of course, you know the story of his life and his ministry, um, at which time uh, he... It explains that he has to leave, he's going to be sent a helper, and, and then is crucified. The veil is torn in two in the temple. Um, that separates, or the, the, the uh, veil that has separated man from God, and now God mm -hmm. has made himself directly available through Christ to all of us. There's no veil separation for us there. Um, also, there is the gospel to the Gentiles after his ascension. Uh, that is a Pentecost for the first fruits. Uh, uh, were, were given, and then the 50 days of Pentecost there, the length of time. Um, you recall we talked about a little bit of, of the third temple. I spent a lot more time on future weeks on that. Some of the wars of Ezekiel that we'll refer to here, and other wars. And then the beast system set up that we have also, like I believe that was probably week five. Um, I'm forgetting the sequence exactly right now. But uh, we'll touch on that a little bit more as we go around the room. All of this happening during the church age, and uh, then there's a pause in the prophetic clock where everything before the church age was dealing with Israel, God was in communication directly with Israel, hung up the phone with them, picked up the phone for us, and that's where we've been in the church age now, and will be until the rapture of, uh, of the church. Um, during the time as we approach that point, there's things happening that are trying to set up the one world government. We also had a, a night on that. So if you haven't caught it yet, we kind of broke this chart down into pieces from week to week to week and added a little bit of stuff to it. But uh, the one world government, uh, the, the one world as a whole, but it's going to have a one world government, one world religion, uh, the ruler, which we know is to be the Antichrist, um, and then the world economic forum and climate change, all these things being important factors of that one world uh, time uh, uh, frame. Um, and then we get into the three and a half years of the tribulation and three and a half years of the great tribulation. If you recall, we use this as a visual to sort of try to think about an option or at least a, a thought that what typically I think is meant or understood to be a time of trouble for believers is that the first half here, the first three and a half years until the, the, um, the abomination of desolation in, in the temple here. But we use this, this visual here to think, what, what happens here during this time? And we remember we, we talked about how um, Ezekiel 38, there's so much destruction that they're burning and, and, just, and collecting bodies and burning weapons and stuff and using that for, for a period of time. Uh, and that takes seven years to do that. Glad I made this. And so uh, we thought, okay, well, what if, what if we're just not thinking about this correctly? And during, because during that last three and a half years after the abomination of desolation, 
the Jews are the uh, Jews are told to run to the mountains, go, and we we, we understand that they you know, they get away, they flee, some are, are killed, but they some make it to Petra and survive. But it's during those seven years that they're supposed to be burning all those weapons and burying bodies and then cleaning things up. So we thought, well, what if the first three and a half years is over here, and this is the first, this is where things start happening, or somewhere before this. Uh, because when they're running for the hills, they're not going to be burning weapons or burying bodies. They're running for their life. Um, so we thought, if this is the seven years of that cleanup, why not it somewhere before that, so that it's done or complete by the time they head for the hills? Just a thought. Uh, we just presented that. And if, if something else you, you may have seen or at least understood over the seven weeks is that one thing that we tried to do was present information that may or may not be accurate, or maybe something a different in, term, uh, in terms of a different thought, Help, helping to see things in different ways that lets you decide really what you believe or understand the scripture to say. Um, we don't have all the answers, but we will hopefully will create food for thought as well. Um, and then we talked about the, 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 the um, creation of the third temple, which was a couple of weeks ago on the chart down there, and the whole abomination of desolation and what happens there. Um, and how that leads into the millennium and the second coming of Christ. So that's kind of a wrap-up of the seven weeks in that one chart and around the room. Um, we also, on that same night, talked a little bit about the wars. This was not too long after October 6 happened, when Israel was invaded by Hamas. So we wanted to present some information about Israel in particular, and the wars that they've been involved with, and uh, what is yet to come. Um, and you will see just real quickly that... There's an obvious delineation in terms of who was involved with wars with Israel at this point here. We have their, their original names from scripture and the modern day names here. And you can see which ones were involved in each of these wars. The War of Independence in 1948 when in one day Israel became a, a state. Uh, the Six Day War in 1967. You can see these uh, indications of who was involved in that and the, some who were kind of peripherally involved with the, with the triangle there, uh, the Yom Kippur War, those three wars, you know, there's some discussion and, and question about was that Psalm 83. You know, we, we have the Psalm 83 wars and then the the uh, Ezekiel 38 wars or war. Um, so that's some discussion about that. Then we had October 7th that happened and who was involved in that? Okay, in the red, um, Isaiah 17, the war against Damascus, the judgment against Damascus. Um, where we talked a little bit about the significance of Damascus being the capital of Syria. Uh, there's, there's a lot of spiritual uh, emphasis in Damascus because it has what they consider to be the third or fourth most holy site for Islam. Uh, so there's quite a bit of significance about D Damascus in that. Um, and that would, of course, be Syria because that's their capital, a political significance for them. Then beyond that, uh, we see in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the invasion from the north, primarily, uh, which is you know, the Gog and Magog uh, issue, and that would take in all of the, into account all of these nations here uh, that would would uh, yeah that would uh, be part of that war against Israel. In addition to those discussions, we broke it down a little bit more here and talked about all the different uh, factions that. The IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, had some kind of interaction with uh, that was military style. Um, Hamas, we see that going on right now. And then also, you know, be, being the Palestinians and how there was some battle over the land for the for the Palestinians and Israelites. Some scripture references involving that. Um, the, the IDF versus Syria um, and Hezbollah and, and coming out of Lebanon. Uh, Egypt and battles that they have. Some of these things are ancient battles. Some of them are more recent. Okay, the IDF versus Iran. That one's that one's a little bit in question in the sense of how directly involved Iran is. Uh, there's a lot of discussion and conversation about how Iran provides support for a lot of these things that are happening, but maybe not they themselves involved in the attacks. So, but there's some reference going on here uh, to IDF and Iran. Uh, with Jordan and, uh, and Saudi Arabia is a big question mark. It's, there's not real clear information about them being directly involved in some of this, but there are some teachers who do mention Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, and their involvement at some point. Um, the Southwest Jordan, uh, 
also part of Egypt, the Edomites, uh, part of ancient Egypt, so we can see some connections there. So lots of battles that Israel has had to deal with over the years, and we read about them in Scripture all the time, uh, particularly in the Old Testament. So we talked about these wars and came up eventually to uh, the, the war of, against Damascus in the Ezekiel 38, 39 verses, and referred to that here, and what the prerequisites were for the Ezekiel 38 battle. We were able to establish that uh, Israel had to re be re uh, regathered from other nations into their land, and we see that happening now in a big way. People are returning. Um, it is in the latter years, and we do believe we were in the latter years based on the things we're seeing happening, um, and uh, you know what has happened already, prophecies that have been fulfilled. They are brought back from the sword, where there's persecution, and we referenced the Holocaust, where you know they were very much persecuted for, the, for who they were, not just what they believed, but who they were. And then the land in Israel had long been desolate, and so the Bible tells us about how Israel was like a desert. I mean, it was basically barren, um, but it was brought back to life, um, and is now no longer what was desolate. And then we also referenced uh, that they must be a peaceful people. Now, Israel, we know our peaceful people. I mean, we can tell from what you just the newscast that, that we hear and the history that we've seen about them wanting to live in peace. Um, but it's very difficult for them to do that because of all the attack that they're under. Um, they are to be in a land of, so we couldn't check that one off. Live, they are to be living in a land of unwalled villages, secure without walls and, and uh, fences, bars and gates. Um, that's not the case yet. There are still fences. They are, they are known to be the most fenced in nation in the world because of the boundaries they have and what borders their country, they have to have some protection and, and, and uh, some way to keep that under check. So that one can be checked off. And they have to have the booty, uh, gold or money, that, or something that, that whoever's attacking them is coming in there to get. Um, we don't know exactly what that is, but there's a question about, well, whatever happened to Solomon's gold, all of his treasures. And, and is that the booty that they're maybe talking about in Scripture that Israel will have or has somewhere uh, that they want to come in and take. Now, after Ezekiel 39, of course, we have, at uh, 38, we have Ezekiel 39, post-Ezekiel 38, where I just mentioned a minute ago about the burning of, of weapons for seven years, and we use a little chart thing to, to maybe speculate a little bit and, and guess what the maybe, perhaps that's different than what maybe been, been thinking in the past. Uh, burying bodies for seven months. Okay, burning weapons for seven years, burying bodies for seven months, or plus, seven plus months. Uh, there has to be a cleansing of the land where people are going around and staking the ground where they find these bodies that the, the next group of, of vacuums come through, I guess, and to clean up the land and cleanse it. Um, and all the nation will know that I am Lord. Okay, so obviously God is going to display himself in a mighty way that everybody is going to know that he's in charge and he will do what he says he will do. And we've heard what he says he will do quite a bit and we can believe it. Now, this was our next week here. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I can even unweave all the lines that are on that chart. But we talked a lot about how all the current world religions actually started at the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel being built by Nimrod um, is a place in the plain of Shinar. And it was built to save man from any future floods, which God said would not happen. He already had given the covenant that there will not be any destruction of the earth by any future floods. But Nimrod was, was called a mighty warrior of God. Um, he introduced fire worship, idolatry, and divination. Um, but and he was the one who was, be, was teaching his, my will, not God's will. It was all about me, all about what he wanted to do. Um, that was, it was the beginning of Babylonian religions. Uh, be like God, power to control. I'm just going to touch real briefly on these because this is, this is a lot to, have to try and go through again with everything else. But uh, we talked about the neo-paganism religions, which is a uh, you know, natural world or a divinity of the natural world or one, uh, worship of nature, the earth, uh, the Wiccan and heathen uh, worship be, uh, was part of that. Mesopaganism, uh, polytheistic, multi-gods or no god, um, esoteric meaning they have a secret knowledge, uh, which tied into Freemasonry and those kinds of organizations that uh, you know, they, they talk openly about you know, what they believe in the sense of a limited amount of knowledge because there's secret knowledge they still have that they only share within themselves. 
Um, human and animal sacrifice and sexual worship. Uh, let's see, let's move down to here. Egyptian mythology, mystery Babylon religions. Here we start talking about some of the gods that, that are referenced to uh, uh, in their myths. Osiris and Isis, Horus, um, who uh, was considered the female uh, magician, the original mother child of astrology, um, is Isis. Uh, Osiris was her husband, and they were the mother of Horus. Uh, and uh, see the king, you see that they're the ones, Rosicurianism, which became something very popular and uh, supported in um, the the Egyptian mythology and Babylonian religions. Um, just kind of buzz through this here. Then we get up here where we have Christianity starting to develop more, getting away from more of this kind of religion over here, which is paganism, and then getting into God and one God, the, the Abraham and, and Judaism, and the one God, Yahweh, Hashem is another word, the Torah, the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, all that rolls into the Christian faith. Uh, and that is God's will, not my will. As Jesus said, Lord, on the cross, you know, not my, or in the garden, not my will, but thy will be done. Um, again, we're talking about a little bit of New Age coming in. I mean, a lot of New Age now, um, but it's whatever a man can think of becomes his religion. It's, it's kind of a, you know, whatever feels good sort of a thing. Uh, visualization, visualization goes into that. Um, I get a little bit uneasy sometimes when people just say, you know, imagine yourself doing this or just picture yourself in this spot or doing that spot. I, I kind of get a cringe in terms of visualization and how that works into new age sort of stuff when you do that. And there are some popular people out there that are teaching that, holding major conferences, thousands of people will attend, and that kind of thing is taught, which makes me a little bit concerned. Um, you, uh, using spirit guides, um, dancing and chanting, chanting are part of that. We got into Catholicism a little bit, where they appeal to Mary or a saint to protect or, or uh, um, their will be done for them. Uh, big thing with Catholicism is, is uh, the liberalism side of things, and rolled into a lot of that. Underneath that, we get it, got into some cults, uh, which you know, again, there's argument about what's the cult and what's not a cult. These are just things that are, are being taught by different people. Um, again, this is a lot of information. I don't want to get you going too big on this for the whole night. Islam, of course, is a big thing in, right now because of what's happening in Israel. And to the believer and to Christian, that is a very significant religion to keep an eye on, um, just to see what is happening against Israel from Islam uh, with the Sunnis, the Shias, and all of that. Um, let's see. Ben Franklin, George Washington, um, you know, Washington, D.C., Skull and Bones, the higher order of the Freemasons, some of our presidents maybe more than I know of, uh, were part of the Skull and Bones uh, organization and of the Freemasons. Um, the pyramid is an important symbol for that, and uh, you'll see that on your dollar bill with the, the pyramid and the eye. The, uh, that's all considered part of that. Luciferian, or the humans are gods. They, they use the upside down cross as their symbol. The name itself implies that it's not really a godly religion, Luciferianism. Satanists, they kind of go together. Uh, you know, they embrace your will and carnality. Okay? All that in one breath. Okay, and these, and I think these are posted or at least available uh, to be seen and downloaded and, and copied and that sort of thing. This isn't copyrighted material uh, that we see here. And we had a little bit of fun. Um, on the night, with, we talked about the Antichrist, and uh, notice we didn't put any names up here tonight. Uh, really, it was just kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek way, but in some ways a little bit serious, to uh, take a look at some possibilities about what the Antichrist might look like and, and kind of who might fit that. And uh, discussion was held about the AC, we call them the AC, it has to be from a Jewish lineage. Um, they have to deny the Father and the Son, in other words, that God is not God, Jesus is not the Son. That was what, of course, what the Antichrist will be teaching and, and forcing other people or trying to force them to believe. Uh, the Fourth Kingdom, the Fourth Industrial Revolution is referred to, or the Fourth Reich, the, the whole globalist move that we're seeing happening right now. Uh, they have to support or embrace that. And underneath each of these we see, when we were looking at some names, how some of these people fit into these categories. 
uh, the people of the prince who is to come, Babylonian or Roman and Syrian uh, uh, interests there. Um, we, yeah, we'll leave that at that. The act against the strong fortresses with help of foreign gods. Uh, there's a few people, even too, that we were talking about that night that we had question marks about whether or not they actually fell into that category. Um, but, uh, you know, with some certainly did. The AC also is uh, the god of fortresses, advanced his glory. So building up his own, his own fortresses, his own uh, uh, kingdom, as you will, uh, that will be used for his glory and supporting that and advancing that. The AC will not regard the desire of women, okay, we meaning, also meaning Mary and, and uh, Jesus or Islam, um, against women. Now, this is just a reference here about how this, that uh, women are viewed by Islam or in Islam uh, in contrast to how the, the world of Christianity and the Bible views women. Uh, but there's no regard uh, for women from the AC. Also, the AC will exalt himself as God. We talk, or the Bible talks about how he goes in to desecrate the temple and proclaims himself to be God. Um, nobody does proclaim that until he does, and he does it himself, to, about himself. Um, so he will exalt himself to be God. And in, in the process of this and, and check marking things, uh, you know, we started looking at how some of these people certainly boast about themselves. They certainly have, are, are puffed up about themselves and what they believe or what they teeth or their own strength, that kind of thing. So they're building themselves up. And then seek to change times and laws. So the whole calendar change, whatever laws have been in place uh, are changed. They're, they're different and they no longer apply and it may come on an onslaught, may come a little piece by piece, but they want to change all of that because they don't like what it was. It's going to be their own thing. Um, and then part of that same night we gave some contrast between Jesus, I said Jesus, and the beast or the Antichrist. Um, again, there's some very detailed information about each of those and how they are different from each other and uh, what, um, what kind of ill will comes from some of these things that are, are in the beast and the eyes of Jesus. But we can see all the comfort and peace and salvation and mercy and grace when we talk about Jesus and what he has done for us and what the scripture talks about. Again, a lot of information there just to refresh your mind on, on some contrasting things. And there's some references here, scripture references on here too, um, that would be helpful if you wanted to go back through these things at a time, sometime and take a look at those uh, in that. Uh, this one here, again, this was going to be talking about the, uh, the uh, one world government, which we, I believe we talked about the, uh, I forget what we called that night now, um, but there's different things here that we talked about the, the um, what am I trying to say here? Uh, building the, the, the mark of the, the, the beast system. There you go, thank you. Working and building up the beast system and the different parts that would go into the beast gaining his control and what could be part of that kingdom and, and what he's going to be doing. Um, digital ID and, and uh, um, the digital currency could be part of that. Um, AI certainly could be part of that, using how, how uh, that becomes part of the control, melding man and beast, we call AI the beast, that we're talking about some robotic stuff, um, becoming something that's a little bit more superhuman. Uh, and uh, the UN Sustainable Goals, the 17 is, uh, SDG, the, the Agenda 2030, the, the year 2030 is, is something very significant in the whole global uh, atmosphere for, for what's to come. That is a year that is a goal to reach, or for, so a lot of these things to be put into place by that year. Okay, and that's not for, that far away. We're only talking six years. But there's a lot of things that are already in place or moving to be in place uh, that we see up here on this, this chart that are headed for that goal. Um, part of the whole um, global system would be the World Economic Forum, that we will own nothing and we'll be happy about it. Uh, it's the Fourth Industrial Revolution, Revolution as we talked about over there. Um, CERN, uh, some controversy over that, but the CERN being that we talked about the, um, uh, the, the high speed, I don't even know what you call that thing, uh, just they cause, causing uh, atoms to hit each other and split and explode and create these energies. And the goal there, at least it's spoken of and is 
stated by them that one of the goals is to open a portal uh, into wherever. Um, but that opening of that portal, of course, is obviously, or would obviously be an open door the other direction as well, coming from outside to the inside. And we believe certainly that that would not be um, somebody that would be God-ordained uh, coming back into us. Um, mention the Gates, excuse me, mention the Gates Foundation um, and how they are greatly involved in a lot of us going into the whole global atmosphere. Um, at one point, uh, I believe I mentioned something about, and it might have been in the sixth or seventh week, sixth week or fifth week, about the Gates Foundation and how Gates has bought all the land in Arizona to create one of these 15-minute uh, cities or uh, make it so that it's, it's self-contained and that he's bought uh, 80,000 80, acres, something enormous. Uh, that he's planning to build the city on. Not getting very far very fast right now because they run into a lot of roadblocks. Um, but a lot of AI is going to be in, uh, implemented in that city as well as some of these, um, uh, where is it now? Some of these, uh, I can't even see it up here now. But just some of the things that, that makes that city more uh, self-contained. And Probably over there, probably over there. Yeah, we'll get to that then and uh, uh, less freedom, uh, and you're, you're bound into that city. The Big Gates Foundation uh, is also into the vaccination of all people, uh, which could change, or they say, will, uh, to change the DNA of people and become a part of the AI more uh, uh, superhuman. Part of the world system also, it would be the mark of the beast, the buying and selling, and engaging in society, or not being able to do that. Uh, chip implant is a big piece of that as well. Um, 15 minute cities, we mentioned that. Removal of fossil fuels, uh, that, you know, getting into more of the dependence on what the government will say you could use or not use uh, for fuel. Uh, the WHO, World Health Organization, big piece of, of uh, the global health crisis and governance. Um, ESG scores, they're headed to a system where each of us will have an ESG score. Remember, we talked about how we'll have an uh, ec environmental, a social, and a government score uh, rating you on how well you fit into each of those and, and what they would think uh, in a positive way or however it is that they can control you. And that score can be used to uh, control or manipulate what kind of freedoms you have or, or you don't have depending on how high your score is. And I, I, I'll throw this out there and I don't know if that's if it's accurate or not or it could be, I don't know. But uh, I do believe that there are some of these businesses and organizations now that are doing things that are more uh, politically correct and uh, not as acceptable to some of us as to others to start ranking their scores higher already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just speculation on my part, take it or leave it. I'm not trying to, to steer this anyway or have any kind of conspiracy built up over that. It's tied to the money. It's, it's tied, tied to the banking. Tied to the banking. So and if you're, they don't you're, have a certain score, they're not going to get their funding. Their funding, exactly right. And I think when it comes down to us personally having ESG scores, uh, that's going to be part of what is used to prevent us from being able to use whatever money we may have if it hadn't been taken away from us already to buy or sell or not. Okay, and then we came over here and we talked a little bit about uh, the different horses that are mentioned in the Bible and uh, the seals that are part of that as well. The, the seal number one and the white horse talks about the, uh, the, the bow being given to the person who's riding the horse, the covenant, they come to conquer and to gain control. Um, and believing that the Antichrist would appear good at that time and makes it, they, they make the seven year covenant with Israel. And that's what we hear when we talked about the, where the rapture happens and then the tribulation starts, but Israel gets their covenant to build their temple, which will later be uh, desecrated. And uh, we, we see in Matthew 24, where it talks about false Christ from the white horse and seal number one, and that horse begins running, and I believe is to be keep on running. There's no reason for it to stop at this point. Seal number two in the red horse, um, that rider is granted to take peace from the earth, kill people and one another, uh, the people kill one another, and uh, there's a great sword given to him. Um, now, this great sword is part of what is used in terms of weaponry and, and power to 
kill people and, and subdue them. Uh, it, these, these promises given by the uh, AC at that time were possibly could result in a world war. Who knows? And that, that's, again, just something to consider. Uh, again, Matthew 24, ethnos against ethnos is ethnicity against ethnicity, brother against brother. <coughs> it's not just nation against nation, okay? It's different ethnic groups even that are referred to at that point. Uh, seal number three was the black horse, where um, scarcity and scales is weighing out in, in the balances who has what, who gets what, who gets what taken away from them, where the, the value of money becomes so low that it takes so much money to buy wheat, it calls it the denarius equals a day's wage, uh, which is nothing. Um, but it says, do not touch or, or spoil the oil and the wine, uh, believing that that has something to do with uh, what the wealthy and the luxury of wealth gives you, um, and to preserve that. Again, Matthew 24 mentions famine, tribulation, and the hatred of, of, of offense. Seal number four is the pale horse. Um, this one is uh, the name of death, where you start hearing more and more about the, uh, the death and the destruction that is happening. Hades uh, comes from behind uh, all of these other ones, but you see they're all eventually, they're running together. Uh, the power over one-fourth of the earth and uh, kills with a sword, hunger, death, and, and the beasts of the field. So there's lots of killing going on, uh, either by hand or by by uh, hunger and, and the beasts of the field. Again, Matthew 24 talks about all these things and it references pestilence and disease for that, for death. And uh, then in verse 9, that was verse 7, verse 9 talks about tribulation. And again, uh, hatred and offense is, is uh, abounding. And that's, that wrapped up the, the four horses, and, but the seals keep going. Seal number 5, I'm going to step to the other side here a little bit, where we talked about the martyrs. And again, the souls under the altar, referring to those who were martyred after the, uh, after the rapture. Um, those being the ones that are they're there, crying out, how long, oh God, must we wait? They're not there yet, because of course we have, I hope there hasn't been a rapture. And they will be there crying out, when are you going to end this? When do, you, when do we get to come out? And they're told, just, just rest a while until the last one has been saved, until the last one has been, been uh, added to the numbers. Um, so these are the ones that were slain for the word and their testimony. Um, because the Antichrist is, is receiving power and in charge of things, they're not going to like what these people are saying. Um, and so they're the ones that are slain for that. Uh, and they're crying out, when are you going to avenge our blood? The Matthew 24, again, verse 9, is they deliver you to kill you. Verse 10, there's a betrayal. Verse 11, false prophets and deception. And verse 12, love of many grows cold. So you can see things, see things very much deteriorated at that point. Uh, particularly at... Uh, for those um, Jews who are still on the earth, were not raptured, but become part of the sealed through the 144,000 and now are testifying. And it's their toast testimony that gets, gets them killed. Seal number six, the cosmic disturbance, way to harm the earth. That's where the seal of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses takes place. Um, mm -hmm. The mountains and the skies we see. This is, I mean, I, I can't imagine being here for that, what that would look like. Uh, but Matthew 24, verses 15 through 21, then also refers to the abomination of desolation. Uh, the Jews are told to flee, those that still remain to flee, um, and the great tribulation coming. So the first three and a half years are considered tribulation, and the second three and a half years are labeled as the great tribulation. Um, this part here, silence in heaven, is the pre-wrath of God. Okay, this, God's wrath has not hit yet. All of this... Prior to this is man-made. Okay, man bring destruction against man. Seal 7 is silence in heaven, Revelation 6.16, where the wrath of the Lamb is revealed, where that comes through and, 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 and uh, makes the great tribulation. First three and a half years is a trib, and the second three and a half years is the great trib. Okay? And then we come here where we were talking about the third temple being built. And there was a, a good bit of, of uh, rep or reference back to previous nights where we talked about some of this. Again, the Antichrist with the Jewish lineage uh, promised to King David that, it would, that, that the throne would not pass from his, his line. Um, so that person needs to have that Jewish lineage. Uh, Stone of Scone, we talked about that, how the king of England for centuries has been crowned 
coronated on top of that stone. The throne that they sit in is sitting on top of that stone of stone of scone, um, and how that ended ended up in England for that that ceremony. Uh, we talked about Jacob's ladder and and uh, that stone being uh, referred to in that. Uh, the covenant with Israel, and that is with many surrounding, uh, not just Israel, but you know, is for with many surrounding nations, brings season of peace. Uh, but then we end up with Ezekiel 38, where that all breaks apart. Uh, God's opinion of the covenant, He does not uh, endorse the covenant. Let's put it that way. Uh, in fact, in Scripture, it talks about Him speaking against that covenant uh, with Israel. <clears throat> Uh, but that does allow the temple to be built, and the the, the uh, Jews favor that covenant because of the temple. Um, it also talked. We also talked about Jesus being that cornerstone. That there's no other. So that stone of stone is not the cornerstone to build a kingdom on. Jesus is our stone. Jesus is our cornerstone to build our build His kingdom on, not ours. Uh, let's see, uh, Jewish beliefs set up for the AC that the Messiah will build the temple. He will have to come for that to be done. The temple will bring peace to the world and heal the whole world. So that, that their belief as they look forward into the time of building the temple is one of a peaceful time. And they'll experience some time of peace. We will experience some time of peace if we're here. Um, but it will be short-lived. Um, we talked about this already. The Temple Institute, uh, the organization set up in Israel right now whose primary focus is to get that temple built. We showed a couple of videos about how the plans for that and what that looks like. They are the ones who are studying the temple plans of the design of old temple garments, all the, the artifacts that were in there, and making sure they understand what they were, even down to their measurements, making the exact uh, um, <clears throat> elements for the temple. And they're the ones training the priests. Now the priests, uh, right now there are 19 priests that are ready to start holding ceremonies for the temple. They, the uh, requirements to be one of those priests is they cannot be defiled uh, by touching anything that was dead. They cannot, uh, they cannot be one, um, let's put the, just use that. They don't go into cemeteries because of that death element that's there. Uh, the ones that they have now, the 19 that are there, I'm sorry, nine, no, numbers 19, but there's nine of them. Um, they were not born in a hospital, they were born at home so that they're not in a hospital where there may be death and dying going on. Um, and they must be cleansed as part of the ceremony. And that cleansing takes place through the red heifer ceremony that we talked about too, and I'll touch on that just briefly. Uh, they do have the land that was purchased about 12 years ago on the Mount of Olives. It was purchased so that it was in a location when the ceremony of the red heifers takes place, the priest will be facing in the direction of where the Holy of Holies will be. And where they believe the temple will be built, so they bought this land here. It's already owned, and they're just waiting for the right time. Uh, it, the ceremony has to happen outside the camp or outside the city. Uh, the reference to that, talking about how you know Christ was crucified outside the city, outside the camp, and that this is a type of ceremony relating to Christ's crucifixion and his death being the cleansing sacrifice for our sins, and the red heifer being the cleansing sacrifice for the nation of Israel, and the, particularly the priests. And that's the, the red heifer ceremony of Numbers 19. There's a lot of information in there about that, talking about what the priests have to go through to be able to conduct that ceremony. Um, the heifers themselves have to be a year and a half to three years old. Uh, some people say two to three years old, anywhere in between there. Uh, and it's right there at that point right now. No blemishes, no more than one black and white hair, never carried a yoke. And this would be the tenth red heifer sacrifice to be held since the time of Moses. And nine of those ceremonies happened up until the destruction of the last temple, the last uh, uh, ceremony was held. This next one will be the tenth one, and they believe, that the Jews believe that that will be the one that ush ushers in the Messiah. So when they conduct that ceremony, that's kind of the beginning of it all for them. Um, there's some discussion now, as some teachers are teaching and saying that this ceremony could happen um, as early as this coming Passover for the Jews. Um, and so the exact date of that I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head, but it, it's coming up in the next few months. Um, and the heifers are old enough. They've got them secluded somewhere. They're just babying those things like crazy. Part of the October 7 attack is admitted by uh, Hamas 
they attacked to try and prevent that ceremony. They knew the heifers were there. They wanted to get at the heifers to prevent that ceremony. And that was just one piece of their reason for that attack. That's how significant it is, not just to the Jews, but to Hamas as well, the Islam. And then last week, we talked about the millennium and the different views of the millennium, uh, namely the pre-trib, pre-millennialism, and how that is a predominant belief or understanding of what that is all about. We're in the church age now. Second coming is sort of a two-phase thing, the first phase being uh, Christ's return, but the believers are caught up in, to be with him. He does not touch earth. Then the, we enter, or whoever's left behind enters the tribulation. Uh, for those seven years, the second phase would be the second coming where Christ does come to earth, sets for the Mount of Olives, splits it in two, and that's where he's coming with the church. The first one is when he comes for the church. And that's where the millennium begins. Christ's kingdom on earth for a thousand literal years takes place until the last judgment that we enter into eternity. Then there was the post-millennialism. Um, it's a progressive growth of righteousness. There's no rapture involved here. But the belief is that since Christ's crucifixion, we started the church age and we will, will remain in the church age until the second coming and last judgment. Um, it is Christ building his kingdom on earth through his church, because he's, doesn't, he's not here, he's still in heaven, but the church is building, building his kingdom for him, and he will return when his church has made the conditions right then for his, his return. Uh, then there's amillennialism, which is symbolic. Neither postmillennialism or amillennialism believe in the literal thousand years. It is figurative, uh, spiritual, and it's, uh, the quote is used for a long time. That's, that's how they refer to it. Again, church age, symbolic, until the last judgment and the, the second coming. And, even, and they believe Satan is bound currently, but uh, evil and goodness still uh, uh, increases during the time of the church age. Now, we also reference um, what each of these, uh, how each of these views Revelation. Revelation for the premillennialists is futuristic. Right? Mostly not yet fulfilled. Some can be uh, considered fulfilled or maybe fulfilled, but mostly not. Uh, Christ's return is before the millennium, and the millennium itself is in the future, and Christ will, Christ will reign on earth, physically on earth, for a literal 1,000 years. Post-millennialism, revelation to them is preterist which means that they believe prophecies have already been fulfilled from Revelation up through Revelation 19, and we are were, we were living in Revelation 20 now. Um, Christ's return is after the millennium, uh, as opposed to the premillennialist, and that uh, the millennium itself is happening right now. It's not a literal thousand years. It's just ongoing through the church age until the second coming, so it's figurative. And then Revelation to the amillennialist is considered idealist, idealistic, is creating a picture that is rosy and very poetic for the Christian life. It continues to grow and get better and better and better. Uh, good, although there's evil involved, uh, the good continues to increase as well. Christ's return is after that millennium, after the symbolic millennium, and it is not uh, physical ruling on earth. He is reigning from heaven. Um, same here, reigning from heaven, but through his church on earth. So that's a quick summary wrap-up of the seven weeks. Um, there was a lot of discussion through all that time about some of these points that were made, and some great conversations were held, some great discussions made in those, in those nights. Um, what, what we want to do here is give just a little bit of attention to uh, the topic of of uh, the rapture review and then to the um, physical and spiritual preparation for the end times. Um, one thing that we keep want to want to think about and keep in mind too is as far as the restrainer and people uh, teaching that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer of the four winds and the and the the, the ending of time through uh, removing that restrainer. Um, there's a there's I think more support, or a lot of support for the idea that the restraint, the restraint is caused by Christ's church, the believers on, on earth, who are still preaching and teaching and, and people are being saved through all of that. And when 
uh, when the rapture happens and we're all removed, then the restraint is no longer there. Yes, there will be people saved. There will be uh, people on earth that are saved after the rapture because there's still going to be the Holy Spirit working in the lives of, of those who are still here. Um, and we know that that's happening because of the souls under the altar who are being kept there until the last person has been added to the flock, been added to the numbers. So there's the salvation is happening, and there's the Spirit having to do some work for that to happen. Um, so even if all the Christians are raptured up, the Holy Spirit's still here. The Holy Spirit will be, still be working because <laughs> how if if there's uh, let me see if I can find some references here. Um, We believe that there is there's salvation that takes place, but how could that happen if there is no work of the Holy Spirit? So there has to be work on our hearts or on their hearts, on somebody's hearts who's being saved during that time. And it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that does that. Now, we are, that we, we are told and believe that the, the Spirit has really three functions for conviction. One is to convict us of sin. One is to convict us of righteousness. And one is to convict of judgment. And uh, it says in, I believe it's John 16 here, if I'm looking at these notes right, I'll read that to you. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin, because they do not believe in me. They do not believe uh, and of righteousness, because they, I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the ruler of the world is judged. So there, there's reference here to continued conviction in these three areas. And if there's salvation for those in, in the tribulation, there has to be some conviction. And the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts. So that's an understanding of that. Um, in John 3, verses 5 to 7, Jesus says, very truly, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So again, some even just logic refers there to that if somebody is to be born again again during the tribulation, they're they're born of the spirit during that time. Okay, does that make any sense? Some? Okay. Um, so the Holy Spirit also seals us in 2 Corinthians. It talks about who, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Um, in Ephesians... Ephesians 1.13, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And also Ephesians 4, verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Okay, we talked about the souls under the altar. We know that there will continue to be salvation because those souls of the altar, as I mentioned earlier, are crying out how long until the last one is, is added to the fold and salvation is still happening by the act of the Holy Spirit that uh, we know that's happening, that salvation is still occurring and the Spirit is the one who convicts to get that salvation. Uh, and John says, I saw a multitude with no one, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, still, still speaking of more, uh, more salvations. In Revelation 7, 13 to 17, then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. The, the New Living Testament says, These are the ones who have died from the great tribulation, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the, they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What a great day that will be. What a great day. Um, so, kind of a whirlwind of information here in review, and um, some things, I think there's one point that we mentioned where the goal that we hope that you will take away from all of these nights is uh, a prompting and urging to understand the Word of God in relation to these things um, and uh, to study and find out for yourselves 
as uh, a priest yourself, what God says and is speaking to you in terms of end times and these particular elements of the end times. Uh, sometimes there's some, I guess I could say a line cross into presenting information that might be a little bit on the edge and not even uh, enough to say this is the way it's going to be. We don't know at all. We don't know what way it's all going to be. So sometimes we would present stuff to you that would hopefully uh, spur on some thought and some desire to learn on your own. We're giving references to places to go to, references from scripture that would support some of these things uh, as they were taught. Uh, so hopefully that's helpful. And sometimes, you know, things that we would present were just kind of speculative. Uh, one in, in particular was we were, you know, talking about the, the, um, the eclipse that is coming up. And how this one guy online has these pins that he would post on his map about uh, a previous eclipse of similar nature where two eclipses crossed at a certain point over the, over the United States, uh, similar to what's going to happen now, almost the same place, things that occurred after it and where it occurred, and what, what, what the names of the cities were that it passed through. And, you know, it was just more for an interest sake kind of a thing. Take it or leave it and do what you want with it. And there were other things like that. Uh, we wanted to show you things, some things that are out there now, and provide opportunity to talk about it before you just hear about it and have no one to talk to. So hopefully that was a goal that was reached as well. Um, in light of that, we want to share, or have shared tonight, uh, uh, Tom Montgomery has some information in terms of the fiscal preparation of things for the end times. Some, some little things that references to, to go to and, and find some more information or find some resources to, to get physical materials um, if you're into that. Now, we have food stored at home. It's not closets and rooms full of food. We, we just think it's prudent to have some, you know, if the power goes out or, or you face some time when you just can't get out and get food. So we have a, a fair amount. Some people have been prepared for years with years of food. We had a friend in California, uh, his wife went out and, and bought a uh, year's worth of food at Y2K. Well, we know how necessary that was now. Um, but he told her, okay, well, you're going to eat this food over the next year. So they, that's what they did. They had to eat that food. And, you know, you can go out and get stuff at Costco now, too, in terms of food and uh, that, that is, has a long shelf life. But, uh, you know, that's the decision you make. But uh, I'm going to invite Tom up to, to go ahead and share some information with you about some of these things. Um, just a real quick introduction to that and uh, give you some resources if you're interested. Good evening, Tom here. Lots of you have seen lots of media out there that has all kinds of information. Some of it blends with this, extends this. It doesn't compromise everything Microphone, else. Please. Everything else that they have taught us, which I has opened my eyes tremendously. Uh, but I've prepared a resource list, if you wish. Pick it up at the door. You know, many things you can look at that will add knowledge about what's going on. All of this appears to be anti-Christian, anti-God. I can't find God anywhere in any of this whatsoever. Uh, they wish to change society in ways that we cannot imagine. So I suggest, inform yourselves. These are some, I think, godly entities that want to tell us more about what might be coming or what we might be able to do to push back on. There are also some people, people, also, I believe, godly people, that have other worldly ways to protect ourselves, protect our families. These people have gone out on a limb to expose themselves to people who, that do not care for them, to tell us how we might take care of ourselves, our families, and our communities. So these little handouts are at the door if you wish to view those. But if you're interested in doing some more work or some more research into uh, this kind of thing, preparation, uh, grab a copy of this. I, I liked the resource list here given on different podcasts um, that are here. One of them is Tucker Carlson, who many of us love, uh, the Epoch Times, uh, Stop World Control, The High Wire, Dell Big, Big Tree, and then the Children's Health Defense with uh, RFK Jr., so there's some credible people, some pretty significant uh, celebrities, if you want to call it that, uh, that can be resources in this area as well. And then there's quite an extensive list here that uh, you can get some more research done or, or places to go to collect 
uh, things that you feel you might need uh, should things uh, hit us in sideways again. So uh, again, those will be over there, like Tom said. Feel free to, to grab a copy of each and do what you'd like with them. Okay, it's up to you. Okay, um, that kind of wraps up tonight. Um, it might have been a little longer if Lorraine were here, but I'm grateful to be able to share with you guys. Tom? Our, your house, same time next week? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Okay. Probably not. Um, and so, the, you know, keep Lorraine in prayer for her health right now particularly tonight, and uh, also pray for uh, uh, Jason uh, Schneider with the church uh, in terms of his leadership and his contribution to this uh, series being able to happen. Uh, he uh, met with us, he was here the first night, for those of you who were part of that, to help introduce the class, and uh, you know, it, this, this came about because Jason uh, has a heart for this kind of thing too. When we met with him and Tim, they oversee the, the adult classes for the church. Uh, Jason told us, as you guys are striking a chord, you're striking a nerve here, this is something that you have a, kind of, have a great interest in. So we're thankful for that and that God has put that on his heart. Um, and that was also you know, something that he had been involved in with the whole Revelation series that he and, and uh, Jack Graham did. So obviously something that he was interested in. But pray for them and, and his leadership in this area and uh, be thankful for that. So once again, thank you all for being here. The folks online, I didn't say welcome to you, but thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, for here in the room, we're thankful for each of you. Hopefully that uh, you can walk away from this and say, um, I was blessed. Um, not go away and say, I was confused. <laughs> or that now I'm really scared. Um, but you know, it's, it's just something that you were able to gain and even just glean some information from. So that you understand what maybe is happening now or what maybe is going to be happening and be able to face that with confidence, with assurance, and with faith that God is in control. These things are lining up with what scripture says. His word is truth and it is a light to our path so we can rely on it, we can face the world and life in the future and in the near future with confidence and faith in him. Yes? Just a word, if you haven't seen Before the Wrath, um Last week, Lorraine talked about the wedding and the symbolism. They call it the Galilean wedding mm -hmm. in this movie. It's, uh, it's really interesting. My family, we, got, we watched it. My wife told us about it, and we watched it. But it goes through that whole Galilean wedding, which talks about how that the, the, the father tells the son when to go, when it's time. Yes. And that's all Good. described or laid out in this quote-unquote documentary. Great. Really, Where, What is it on, John? It was either Prime or Netflix. It's on Prime. It's on Prime. On Prime, okay. I thought it was Prime. Okay, it's, um, it, just for the folks that are, are online, uh, discussion about the uh, documentary or the, the movie Before the Wrath. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, to be watched. It has some of the discussion about what Lorraine mentioned last week and the whole wedding ceremony and the father and the son and how that all works together and the father saying it's time to go. And that all is referred to as the Galilean wedding um, in the movie. So some encouragement there to uh, watch that, and it will be obviously be touching on some of the things we've talked about. Great, thank you. All right, any other last comments or questions from anybody for tonight? I have one comment. Real comment, quick. yes. When you asked about if all the Christians are raptured up, then nobody's left here to, to talk to them. But in the movie, and I know it's just a movie, but, you know, left behind, but remember when, if those of you that saw it, when the, there was a there was a man that was a pastor, and he was left He's behind. Up. And then the main star of the movie that he wasn't taken up, but his wife was, and he went to church and he says, "I'm so surprised to see you here." And he said, "I was preaching this, but I honestly did not believe it." So, but now he did, of course. Right. So there will be people like that that will be here that will definitely people that know to, but didn't practice. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, maybe didn't believe, didn't they know believe. the information, yes, yes. Um, and certainly for them to have that kind of conviction, the Holy Spirit must be working on them to help them understand what they didn't believe. Well, Very also, good, thank you. Also the rapture, even the children before the age of accountability or the newborns, I believe they're going to be caught up. Yeah, because they haven't reached that age of accountability yeah. yet. Yeah. Um, so so there's, there's, there's some discussion in both ways about that too. Yeah. 
I just learned last week from talking to my mom that there's actually a K. Arthur believes in pre-trib, but she considers pre-trib before the great trip. <coughs> so, so she believes that we'll be here three and a half years. The first three and a half years. Yeah, they're teaching them that as well. There, but she still calls that pre-trib. Okay. Because my mom did a, co a whole year course with her on uh, Revelation. Mm -hmm. So I looked into that because my mom and I kept butting heads over because she kept saying pre-trib. And I was like, yeah, but this signifies pre-trib. But I went and looked it up. And sure enough, she does say she's pre-trib, but she decides the trip it's before okay. the great trip so just and that's that, that's k into. arthur yeah who teaches that and, and for those online the comment was that uh k arthur has a study where she teaches that pre-trib is actually the mid, mid midpoint of what we're calling the tribulation there's the, the trip and the great trip and her uh, belief is that uh the tribulation actually begins at that midpoint okay and so she's pre-trib because it begins at that midpoint, so she thinks or teaches anyway that we're still here. Tribulation has not happened anyway. Very good. Good comments. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you again, everyone. Um, feel free to roam the room if there was a week that you weren't here and you wanted to get some of the reference materials that are here. And don't forget what uh, Tom has made available on the counter over there. So let's let's pray to close the night. Father God, we just are grateful again we come to you and thank you for all that you've done in the past several weeks in particular but just all that you've done over time the history of time uh, and Lord and how through these seven weeks we've been able to take a look at your word and uh, sort of piece together what that time has looked like uh, and and use your word to see what time in the future will or may look like and Lord we just ask that you will continue to work on our hearts work on our minds, um, help us to be able to understand what it is you want us to know from your word in everything that we do and all that you have to say there, Lord, whether it has to do with end times or just daily life. Uh, we know that you have the answers there, Lord, and that they are not wrong. They cannot be wrong. We thank you for the surety of that. We thank you for the surety that you give us in our salvation for through your mercy and grace. And we praise you for all that in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.